All right, very good. My name is Fred Niehaus. I'm a technical marketing engineer based out of Ohio. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about 6GIG and a little bit about just radio in general. So uh, put up with me for a little bit and I'll get to some of the new products that we got talking about. So anyway, uh, I wanted to talk some, about some things that are on my uh, top of my head. This year, like, we lost two people. I was driving around in the car and heard on radio on NPR that Chairman Minow died, and I, I want to talk about him in a little bit. And I also want to acknowledge Peter Eppelstein. Peter Eppelstein was a Cisco employee, and that man did everything to work with the FCC to get these spectrum, you know, six gigahertz spectrum available for people to, to use. You know, you had to convince the FCC that you can coexist with the incumbents or the licensed people. And Peter chaired the uh WFA Alliance, he did some, a lot of things with IEEE. And anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And also, uh, when you talk about Chairman Minow, which is I think is kind of funny, you know, he's known as saying that back in the days when radio, when TV stations went on the air in the morning and went off at night, he goes, if you stay glued to that television set, watch it all day, I, I will assure you it's a vast wasteland and it's useless, right? And anyway, the guy uh, from Gilligan's Island you know, the Sherwood Schwartz that put that together, he named the ship the USS Minnow. And, and every day that show would come on TV, they'd say, if not for the courage of the fearless crew, the Minnow, the fearless crew, the Minnow would be lost. And then he'd say the Minnow would be lost. And he'd show that that ship with a big hole in it, you know, and it's just kind of a, a poke at, at Newton, right? But uh, but I, I, the thing about him is, if, if you go back to early days, and I'm a radio guy. My dad gave me a radio very similar to the one that you see in this picture on Gilligan's Island. That, that radio is a Packard Bell AR-851. It's a eight-transistor radio. And I got one of those when I was about five or six or so. And I listen to radio all the time. you know. And that's what started my love into this whole thing. And if you uh, if you listen to radio at the time... Radio stations were all around the country, and if you put an antenna outside, you could hear them. And it was like WSM, where, where Sam's at down there in Nashville. There was WLS, World's Largest Store, Chicago, Sears Tower. There was WRVA in Virginia, you know. But anyway, all of that got me in the ham radio and things. And uh, the government, federal government, ran a time station. They still do. They set it up in the 1940s. And when they did, they, they put WWV and WWVH. H stands for Hawaii. They had a transmitter in Boulder, Colorado, one in Hawaii, and it would transmit the time. And, and, it, and you would calibrate your ham radio to that, and you'd move it down there, and you'd hear, you know, these ticking sounds. And then it would say, at the tone, the time will be 1239 coordinated universal time. That would go beep. And um, about four years before I was born, Newton Meadow became the chairman in 1961, the year I was born. But four years before I was born, these ham radio guys were playing around listening to time signals. And this is my demo here. And you would, when they went to, to 20 megahertz to listen to that, just a little north of 20 megahertz, you could hear this. And these ham radio guys said, what the hell is that? That was Sputnik. That was the very first transmitter from space. It started out in 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz, a little bit north. And all of a sudden, it's like, what the hell is that thing? And that started the space race. Uh, John F. Kennedy said, we're going to put a guy on the moon. And and Newton Norman was a, one of them stuffed shirt attorneys. And he helped JFK with his campaign and ended up being the commissioner of the FCC. Well, the reason that I, I bring that up is because... You can't transmit ground station satellite work on 20 and 40 megahertz. You know, you know those were frequencies that, that were really low. Newton was the guy that basically said, let's open up spectrum for satellite operators. Let's let's use frequencies up in the gigahertz range and things. And he coordinated all that and he put that together. And when when uh several years later on uh, 69 or so, when we put a guy on the moon, finally put somebody on the moon. I was uh, eight years old. I watched that on TV, and I happened to live 10 minutes from where Neil Armstrong's parents lived in Wapakoneta. We call that Wapak instead of Wapakoneta, but these Ohio cities all got Indian names. But anyway, Newton says it's not walking on the moon. It's communications. It's sending people's thoughts. It's it's coordinating. It's He was basically 
saying you want the internet before there was ever an internet. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge him. I think he's pretty cool. But this vast wasteland thing kind of got me to thinking a little bit because um, I grew up on that vast wasteland. If I wasn't playing with the radios, I was watching TV. And uh, anyway, I'm a radio hardware guy, just to kind of give you a little background. I'm a radio hardware guy. Um, started with Cisco. Well, I've been doing unlicensed since 1995. Uh, Cisco bought us in 2000. I was original Aeronet guy. And I got a poster back here. So they bought us in 2000. By 2008, we did a billion dollars in wireless. I have no idea how much we do now. But I'm kind of proud that I was part of the team that got that going. Anyway, um, it, it's kind of funny because I mobility field day people seem to like to use Thursdays. You know, I did I did a mobility field day talk. It was either Barcelona or Berlin. I don't remember. And I went down there and, and talked about something. And I hot-footed it back from over the pond back home. And first thing I did is run over to the flea market. And there's this guy with a Martin guitar over there. And I'm looking at that guitar. I go, what year is that guitar? And he goes, you don't know me, do you? And I'm like, no, should I? He goes, well, you ought to. I ran your audio mobility field day in Berlin or, or, or where the hell it was. And I just thought small world that, that, that you could run into somebody like that. So I put him in there. And um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about me for a minute. I, I uh, you know, I was raised up on his TV. You know, I love the Andy Griffith show. Andy Griffith was a small town sheriff. My dad was a small time sheriff and also played guitar. So uh, it's just kind of a, a cool thing. The guy behind him there holding the mandolin is Roland White. Roland White's is this place here called the Station Inn on, in Nashville. He's one of the Nashville super pickers. And anyway, all this stuff in TV influenced me as a kid, right? You know, Star Trek, I'm a big Star Trek fan. Spock was talking to the, uh, M5 Duotronic computer from Daystrom, you know, Dr. Daystrom. Well, no few people know this, but Daystrom Technologies was a holding company and they they owned Heathkit, you know, then a lot, a lot of other different electronic companies. And uh, you know, although Nichelle Nichols or Uhura was the communications officer on, on the enterprise, the guy that always got my attention was was uh, a guy named Ivan Dixon, the guy down there at the bottom holding the microphone. It was on TV show. Hogan's Heroes. He was the telegraph operator. And I was learning Morse code at the time. I was trying to understand what he was trying to send, you know, and he was all referred to as a technician. I'd never heard, heard of the term technician when I was a kid. Now I, I wanted to be one of those, right? And, you know, the, the cartoons had flying robots and, you know, the, the between Star Trek and Lost in Space, that's that robot over there in the corner. You know, all of that technology just kind of got me going, right? And it was, and all these things were all dovetailed into either music with the Andy Griffith show or Hee Haw or something like even, even lost in space. The guy that flew that ship, you know, was John Robinson flew the Jupiter two. And you'd see him on a horse with Ben Cartwright on Bonanza. when <laughs> if you watched enough TV, anyway, that's enough of that. I want to talk about now chairman pie of the FCC. I just talked about Newton. That's, that's way old school. Chairman pie is the guy in April of 2020, kind of funny, it's April Fool's Day, they made that announcement, but April 2020, they proposed new rules to unleash the unlicensed spectrum in six gig and open it up. Man, and this is a big deal. Uh, you know, and, you know, Peter Ecclestein had a lot to do with that. So a lot of our competitors had a lot to do with that. But if you look at the paperwork, you'll see that FCC quotes Cisco saying the growth of these devices is why we need this spectrum, blah, blah, blah. If you look at that spectrum, 2.4 gig, you only got three channels. You got a little bit in five gig, but now you got this whole great big thing open on six gig. And that's why I say it's like, it's the biggest upgrade we've had in 20 years. It, it, it's a huge deal. It's important. So 2020, they, they announced it. By 2022, we had two flagship products out there that, that would work in six gigahertz. So Meraki had the MR57. And we had the Catalyst 9136. Catalyst 9136 is a, it's a badass radio. That, that radio, that, that AP has got 12 radios in it. And that's not counting the IoT radios, scanning radios. It can do 5 gig and 8 by 8. It can do a whole lot of things. But, uh, but as Fall said before, you, you, you know, this having two companies and all that kind of goes against Cisco's badge of no technology religion and, and keeping things separate. So, we kicked out now three APs 
that work in both Meraki and enterprise on premises, right? The Catalyst 91, 62, 64, 66. And they're incremental. I'm not a sales guy. I'm not going to dwell on this, but just take away from it is, you know, low, medium, high. And uh, each one's got more radios in it, more features, functionality. But this 9166, I want to get to talking about in a little bit because we've done some things to that. But anyway, it's time now, in my opinion, to start looking at six gig, adding it to your network if you don't already have it in your network. Uh, you know, it's more spectrum, more channels, no legacy stuff out there. So everybody runs really fast. It's 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 just, you know, it's just new, exciting and and does a lot. Right. And clients are coming and there's a lot of clients already out there. You know, Apple has the um, you know, Apple has always had Wi-Fi in their devices. This is the very first Apple phone that was ever made. And, you know, this thing had Wi-Fi in it. But anyway, the the Apple products right now, the iPad Pro mini. M2 and the MacBook, they all have Wi-Fi 6 in it. And the next version of iPhone, I assume, will as well. If it's not already in that and just not turned on, I don't know. Uh, laptops from Intel, they've got it in there. They're pushing you to Windows 12 or whatever. If you've got 11, they're saying that to use this, go to go to 12. But there's a lot of clients out there that are coming, and, and that's kind of important to know. You know, people like to hand wave a lot, right? And I, and I saw this thing sent out on, on one of the mailers that uh, I subscribe to. He's like, look, look, I got, I use six gig and I went, you know, this fast over here, 1172.3 versus only 44 with five gig. And I, I sent him a message. I go, was that the same channel with, same everything? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I used 160 meg bonded on a quiet channel on six gig. And on five gig, I used the corporate network with 20 megahertz and 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 typical traffic on. I'm like, well, okay, you know, what's your point? Well, I guess the point really there is that six gigs here, it's a highway, it's open, it's clear, it's all about spectrum efficiency, user experience. You can actually get these kind of speeds, real world, you know, and and but the big thing is that it solves the spectrum limitations in 2.4. You know, you don't have much in 2.4. You don't have much in 5. The thing about 5 gig is that when we negotiated being able to use 5 gig, you had to leave the frequency if it happened to be in that little section there that, that was terminal Doppler radar, you know. Or, and uh, with, with 6 gig, you've got this whole spectrum. And if you use low power indoor, which is what most APs are today, they're all, all reasonably low power. They can run across the entire spectrum, all the channels. You don't have to frequency coordinate. You don't have to get off the channel. You don't have to do anything. If you increase your power, and, and, and there's methods to increase power or have products with higher power, then you got a, a, an issue here, right? Because there are incumbents or licensed people on that six gig band, especially in, in Uni 5 and Uni 7. And They've got dedicated links. So if you look at the corner, bottom left there, if you've got a building right in the middle of that link or so, if you're running low power APs, it's okay. You can still run them. You don't have to vacate the channel like you do with, with weather radar on five gig. But if you run higher power or you use external antennas or you do things like that, now you know you're coming into a different, different realm. So low power indoor, not an issue, but standard power requires frequency coordination based on GPS, AP height, and a requirement to check against a known database of these licensed incumbent people. So a little bit of challenges there. There's there's methods that we're working out to automatically have the AP query the database or the system query it and go through the channel. But that stuff is still kind of coming down the road a little bit. But I want to talk about power since I've been crowing about low power. If there's something called spectral power density, okay, and, and the problem is in 5 gig is whatever your power is in 5 gig, that's what it is, right? So if you're on a 20 meg channel, you'll have 23 dBm max power there versus only 18 dBm on 6 gig. Now, 6 gig is a smaller radio wave, takes more power to go farther because the wave is smaller, et cetera. So kind of, if you try to do a bake-off on a 20-meg channel, you're going to go, oh, that's six gig stuff. That yeah, isn't worth anything. Oh, I hate this thing. You start bonding the channels, though, and with six gig, your power goes up 3 dB every time you go up a channel length, right? In five gig, 
you kind of lose that power. You start out really high and at 20 meg, you go to 40 meg, you lose 3 dB because now you're spreading that da- out across 40 meg. And 80 meg, another 3 dB. You're, you're losing power the wider the channel you go. If you look at this chart, once you start to get to about you know, 40 megahertz, you know, first bonding, and a couple dB difference or so between 6 gig and 5 gig, you know, if you if you have three dB difference, you can see a difference in the signal, and you can see a difference in in the quality. You get to six dB, and you're basically doubling the range. So when you get to eighty meg on an eighty meg bonded channel, you actually got twenty four dBm versus twenty three on five gig. So as you use six gig and as you bond the channels out, you get you gain a little bit more power, and that makes things a little better. Is 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 the point I'm trying to make? Now, Jim Forwick does this, and when he does this slide, it's animated, and things pop up, and he talks to it real deep. But I just wanted to steal it from him and show you that at 80 meg, you know, you 23 dBm, 5 gig, 24, cell sites are about the same. And Jim makes the point that at 80 megahertz with 6 gig, you got 14 channels there versus only 5 channels at 5 gig. So it's, you know, it's a game changer. It's important to understand. And there's a lot on site surveys modeling, you know, Hamana, Ekahau, everybody makes utilities that do that kind of thing. So just kind of be aware of that. Uh, also, these power classes, this was a build-out slide, too. I couldn't stand it, so I got rid of all the, the build-out in it. Anyway, uh, indoor is what's most popular right now. You can use the entire 1,200 mega spectrum in the U.S. and Canada, other places. Um, a couple things. It uh, is indoor-only integrated antenna required. And it's fixed AP operation, which means you're not going to put this on a boat or a car and go drive around where you can cause interference to these microwave links as you move about, right? Well, that's kind of the the limitations there. Standard power, like I said, you lose frequency and it has to be coordinated. Very low power and client devices, I don't really care much about those. But, but, you know, for very, very low power, it's possible to do mobility, maybe car to car, things like that. But, but. You know, I'm focusing on this low power indoor because that's what we do. So looking at that, integrated only antenna required. That sure causes a lot of problems because I like to do deployments where I like to focus my energy places, right? So if if you if you're putting something up traditionally, we would take a 9120 or 9130 and we'd marry it to a 6 dBi antenna. And we'd cobble that all together and point at where we want the signal to go. And Meraki had the same thing with the MR46E and the and their antenna. But the thing is, is, is to focus it typically required external antennas. External antennas add to the cost and complexity of the installation. And it's not supported without, you know, frequency coordination, other noise. So what do we do, right? Well, we thought, let's just take that 9166 AP, the 9166I, let's redesign the front of that thing and put an integrated 6 dBi antenna on it. If we do that, you don't have these bulky cables and it handles most of the installation asks and requests, you know, for things. You can have similar coverage patterns and it it solves most of the popular external antenna use cases worldwide, regardless of regulations, less components, Less components, less cables, less points of failure, better mean time between failure ratings, and it's just aesthetically a lot better, right? So uh, if you do that, that leaves us with the 9166i, which is the design for ceilings, does a 360-degree pattern, and this new 9166d1. The d1 has got the integrated antenna in it. Now, if I grab both of them here, I used a magic marker about 20 minutes ago. Give you an idea of the differences here on, on the size. The antenna is slightly thicker on the directional antenna model versus the omnidirectional ceiling mount model. Other than that, they're, they're pretty close to, to identical. I mean, you can just put them in e- either way. The um, features on that line up the same as the 9166i for the most part except this has a directional array on it, right? So if we look at that uh, directional array on six gigahertz, we bump the DBI to eight DBI on six gigahertz, and you got six DBI gain in two, four, and five. Why did we do that? Well, again, six gigahertz is a small radio wave, harder to push. Let's give that a little bit of an advantage on the directional antenna side of things, and between the power spectral density increases that you get on six gig, 
it starts to scale out pretty well. So so that that AP basically gets you what you had to cobble together before, which I think is a is an important thing. The other items are are just sales things that are there that you can see on the spec sheets when you look them up. But the the cool thing is that this AP uses the same bracket one and bracket two. Now bracket one doesn't fit an articulating arm. What we've got here is this is the AP itself with an articulating arm on it. So that way you can pivot it up and down, side to side, and aim this exactly where you want to aim that, that product, right? Um, but using bracket one and bracket two, bracket two's got a hole pattern that lines up to that arm. Bracket one ah, could be used if you had a use case where you wanted to point directly down, maybe you got an airport hanger and you're covering somebody standing in front of the airplane or something. But but for the most part, we, we say bracket two. By the way, these two brackets, one and two, we've had them for 15 years. A lot of competitors are making products that, that basically accidentally fit our brackets because, you know, when you have a billion plus of these things out there, you kind of, you know, want to want to somehow be compatible, I guess. Anyway, enough of that. Hey, Fred. So, yeah. For directional antennas and six gigahertz, right? You're doing that integrated, so you don't have to have AFC in play. Is that the story? Absolutely. I, I so want to be going to ship before I'm AFC. Some, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go through some use cases of why you want this product. But yes, you don't need to have AFC. You don't have to. You know, you you've got the whole spectrum, and you got direction anyway. That's a big deal. Uh, this is just a look at the port. So you've got environmental sensors, which may or may not help you. You know, if, if if you are going for the smart building approach, that's really cool. If this thing is up high and directional and pointing down, I don't know how much benefit there is there. But, you know, but you have it anyway, because this product is is the 9166. It's a 66 ion steroids with, a, with an antenna. I'm going to talk now a little bit about that antenna design. So... In Richfield, Ohio, where I'm at, we've got one of the best antenna modeling labs in the world, bar none. Okay, we can create those heat bowls you see at the corners. You can, we create the antenna patterns. Now we're making the same products across the board, as Fal mentioned, uh, Fal mentioned with uh, Meraki and, and, and our products. But we model these antennas. We build them. You know, if I'm making it, if we make an antenna, one that you can see through here, you know, if you move an antenna element or something like that on, on there, you know, we build the antennas on site, model them both mathematically and actually electrically, you know, in the chambers and all. We build everything we want to do. This is an example of the antenna on the 9166D1. That's the antenna we made in Richfield, this one right here. Then we send it out to somebody and get pretty colors made up and get, get the final mint at it. And then we test the final. And if we're happy with it, we then integrate in the product and we go on. A lot of people don't have this ability. They farm everything out. You know, um, it's not a slam. It's just, you know, we do this and I want to call it out because I'm damn proud of it. Right. So anyway, if you look at the antenna on this on this 9166 D1, uh, the antenna gains, like I said, we give you 8 dBi in the IoT antenna. We give you 6 dBi in the 245, 6 dBi. In the other five, half of that, and eight, you know, six dBi and six gig. It says eight, or, uh, I'm sorry, eight dBi and six gig. So that said, if uh, rather than bore you with all these damn patterns, I took two patterns, one using the 9120 and the six dBi antenna, and laid it up against the 9166 D1. And you can see the patterns are pretty, pretty close, pretty good. But when you get to the 9130 and the, and the C9103 6 dBi antenna, look at that. That's really what we calibrated that antenna to do. We wanted that thing to, to, to be fit, form, and function like that 9130 with the 9103 antenna. If you pull that down and you put this thing in its place, you get rid of the antenna, you get rid of the AP, you got one clean, aesthetically pleasing thing that goes in one spot. So that's, that's, that's a big deal. Now, the 9166D1 and the 9166I are the two, two model APs that can do dual five or do six. So if you've got a country that can't do six gig, or maybe you just don't want to deploy six gig this month or this year, you can lay this thing out, do dual five, 
Their software smart enough to say, hey, I'm starting to hear six gig clients. I'm going to pull out a dual five and go into six gig if, if you want that to do that. A lot, a lot of things can happen in software with this if you want. But the takeaway is you have these options. Now, if you have the 9136, which is the flagship AP, that damn thing runs five gig and eight by eight mode and two and six gig and two four all concurrently, right? And, and they've been cool with the software, but eventually you'll be able to break that software into two fives, a six and a two four. So 9136 is the flagship and it's better in some ways. This is better in other ways because you have one model AP, both directional and omnidirectional to choose from. Same fit farm function, you know, so just be aware that those those products exist. This is just a slide saying, look, you can do dual five. You know, I don't care about that. But I, but I want to talk about this a little bit. And that's that if you do choose to do a five and a six or dual fives, it's omnidirectional in the 9166i. If this thing's a 6 dBi, you're not going to have two macro cell. You, you know, you're going to have a 6 dBi pointing where it's going, doing two cells, right? So, you know, it, it's a little different. But other than that, you know, it, it's flexible. It does pretty much everything. Uh, where do you want to use this product, I guess, is the next question, right? Well, if you've got auditoriums and things, you you can put this up and, and focus it in different areas and distribute that load a lot better. And, um, you know, you could do this with Omni and APs as well, but, you know, but they're radiating, the APs are going to hear each other. And, you know, it's, it's cleaner when you can put the energy where you want it to, where you want it to be used, especially in warehouses. That's where you got those real long aisleways and things. You could put this thing in the middle of a, of an, of a long aisle back to back shooting down the aisle or on each end of the aisle shooting in, right? You can do either one. Um, there's issues if you put any AP close to another one. If I take any access point or even client at an access point and you put it less than 12 inches away or so, you're just going to swamp it out, right? You, you know, you're basically having so much energy out of one AP in, in the near vicinity of a receiver that it's not good, right? So, so the front to back ratio on this is about 20, 25 dB or so, giving us all maybe about 40, 50 dB of isolation if it's like that. And ideally, you want 70 dB isolation to guarantee there's no descents or any problems, right? So I tell people, well, can I get away with it back to back? Do I have to spatially put this out? You know, ideally, I'd like to see an AP two meters away from another AP, you know, six feet. Don't cluster them. You can do that. You can cluster them, provided you test them. If you test both APs operating concurrently at the same time, for degradation, then test them one at a time. You can see how much degradation you have, if any, right? And you can fix degradation or descents in a receiver by either frequency going farther apart in the spectrum, you know, use five gig and six gig or the lower end of five and the upper at six, whatever. Or you can turn power down or you can get them away from each other. You know, so th just be aware that, you know, that. Can you do it back to back like in that picture? Would would I probably not? I'd probably space it out a little bit, but you know, test it. You might find you might be amazed at that. You take long hallways. The reason I'm not in person with you guys is that woman down at the bottom is my significant other. She is an ARF engineer, original Aeronet employee. She put that AP up in that ceiling. She's getting cancer treatment. That's why I'm not down with you. You can use this for airports. Takeaway slide, I'm done. This is the year for six gig. If your Wi-Fi is three years or older, it's time to upgrade that damn thing. Well, we're going to Wi-Fi 7. There's no reason to do that. I would, you know, it's a long ways away. Six gig clients will free up your existing five gig channels. Everybody's happy. 